Hello again. Okay, last time uh, we looked at the concerto, the genre known as the concerto, which is a piece, remember, that carries over from the Baroque era into the classical era. At least the solo concerto does. The concerto of the classical era is the type that has a solo instrumentalist backed up by an orchestra. The concerto grosso, the other type with the small group backed up by an orchestra, that does not carry over into the classical era. But the solo concerto remains a popular type of piece. Um, a concerto is a three movement work, does not have a dance like movement, and there are some other little quirks, uh, some other little differences. So, for example, in both the first movement and sometimes the last movement of a classical concerto, there is a, an extended solo section towards the end of the movement called the cadenza. And this is where the soloist, whether we're talking about a pianist or a violinist or a flute player or a cello or whatever, um, the soloist will have a chance to sort of go off on their own and do a quasi-improvised, maybe really improvised, or maybe pre-composed but written in such a way that it sounds improvised. So I say quasi-improvised solo. It is also designed to sort of show off the performer's technique. The concerto is kind of a showpiece. That's the whole idea. Um, one other thing that I mentioned last time, in a first movement of a concerto, we have this double exposition sonata form, where we still have the exposition, development, and recapitulation. But instead of one exposition which is repeated, we have two slightly different expositions. The first one just for the orchestra, and the second one for the soloist and orchestra together. All right, so um, what I want to do now is to start to listen to some complete works all the way through. Instead of just individual movements in order to, to uh, demonstrate what the forms of these different movements tend to be in, and uh, again, I'm referring to this handout uh, that I made for you guys. So we've been talking about what is typical in each of the different movements in terms of form, but we haven't really listened to a complete work the way that it's really meant to be listened to, all the way through all the different movements. And so we're going to do that today. What we're going to do is we're going to listen to a piano sonata by Beethoven. Now, the first movement only of this sonata uh, has a listening guide in your book, beginning on page 199, if you have the ninth brief edition. So if you have your book, why don't you turn to that now, because we're going to be using this listening guide as we listen. I've also uh, posted uh, in my saved videos links to performances of this piece. So this is the Piano Sonata in C minor, Opus 13, commonly known as the Pathétique Sonata. It has this nickname, Pathétique. I'll talk, I'll talk about what, what all that means in a moment. Um, so this happens to be a three-movement sonata. A piece with the title sonata in the classical era usually has three movements, although some Beethoven sonatas have four. Remember, the only difference between a four-movement piece and a three-movement piece is that in a three-movement piece, like a concerto, for example, the dance-like movement, the third out of four, is the one that's left out. So this is a three-movement sonata, and it does not have a dance-like movement. It has a fast first movement, which is in sonata form. It has a second movement, which is slow and lyrical, and which happens to be in rondo form in this particular piece that we're going to listen to. Second movement happens to be in rondo form. But remember, generally speaking, second movements could really be in pretty much any form. It's just that this one happens to be rondo form for the second movement. Now remember, there are two different varieties of rondo form. There's the short rondo, which I have listed here. The short rondo, which is A, B, A, C, A, five-part rondo. And then there is the long rondo, or the seven-part rondo, which is A, B, A, C, A, B, A. So the only difference is in that seven-part rondo, we bring the B material back one more time toward the end, but then we also have to, that means we have to bring back the A material one more time, because the idea, remember, is that we want to begin 
and end with the same basic material, the A theme. In this sonata, the slow second movement happens to be a short rondo, and the fast final movement happens to be a, a long rondo, a seven-part rondo. So, um, before we listen to it, though, let me talk a little bit about Beethoven. Now, I am going to have, actually, my, my next couple lectures are going to be more biographical. They're going to be sort of the life and times and music of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, our three greatest uh, composers of the classical era. But um, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Beethoven specifically as the composer of this piece and about the piano and the, the evolution of not only the instrument itself during the classical era, but the evolution of piano technique. Because you will hear um, in this piano sonata that we're going to hear now a, a difference between the way Beethoven approaches the piano, the way he utilizes the piano, and the piano style of Mozart that we listened to last time. Remember, what the piece we listened to last time was a piano concerto for piano and orchestra, but still you can get a sense of how Mozart writes for the piano. Um, Beethoven's piano music, generally speaking, is more technically challenging. It exploits more of the piano. It's more difficult. It has more notes, right? It, has, it, it demands more of the pianist. And this is in part because of the natural evolution of any human activity or skill, you know. If you compare, I don't know, basketball players in the 1950s and 60s with the way Michael Jordan uh, played back in the 1980s or the way uh, uh, LeBron James plays today, I mean, the, the state of the art is always advancing, right? But also, in this time, the, this, the piano itself is evolving. Um, remember, the piano was invented around 1700, which is, technically speaking, in the Baroque era. But it took a while for the piano to kind of catch on and to come into general use and to replace the harpsichord. And that doesn't really, that, that process is not really complete until, the, let's say, the beginning of the classical era, around the 1760s. But early pianos were not as sturdy or, as, uh, or have as much range as later pianos. And part of this has to do with the fact that um, early pianos were made completely of wood. Now, when you look at a piano today, you say, well, yeah, it looks like it's made of wood. Well, yeah, there's wood on the outside and there's some wood on the inside. But the frame of a modern day piano is made of iron. And we need an iron frame to hold back the tension of the strings. Think of a guitar, for example. When you're tuning the strings on a guitar, you've got six strings. And those strings, you are increasing the tension on them. And if you increase the tension too much, the whole guitar is going to want to snap shut on itself like a bear trap. Well, the piano has way more than six strings. And there's a lot of strings and they're under a lot of tension. And if your frame of your piano is made completely of wood, you can only have so much tension before the thing starts to bend back on itself as the strings are tightened in tune. Right? Early piano manufacturers at first were kind of reluctant to, to use metal in the piano because they thought it would affect the sound, that it would have a sort of a metallic sound instead of a nice woody sound. This turned out to be not true, actually. The, the sounding part of the piano is still made of wood. The soundboard, it's sort of like the speaker of the piano, is made of wood. All we need metal for is to strengthen the frame and to hold back the tension of the string. So at first, some manufacturers began to use uh, metal plates to reinforce that wooden frame. But eventually, um, they came up with the idea, in fact, an American uh, inventor came up with the idea of making a cast iron frame and, and having that be the starting point and kind of building the piano around it rather than building a wooden piano and reinforcing it with metal plates. So there's a long process of evolution that coincides, by the way, with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So the, the modern piano is kind of a product of the Industrial Revolution. And this evolution of the piano becoming bigger, having more notes, able to withstand more tension in the strings, uh, therefore 
capable of a uh, greater a greater variety of tone color, greater variety of uh, of volume as time goes on. This process of evolution is happening basically during Beethoven's lifetime. And Beethoven himself is one sort of a driving force behind this evolution because uh, Beethoven was known for smashing pianos that were not up to the task of being handled by uh, Beethoven. Um, so, you know, Beethoven actually worked with piano, piano manufacturers, and piano manufacturers would send Beethoven pianos to try out because if you could get his endorsement, you know, maybe that was, uh, you know, if it was the piano that Beethoven played, well, that was something, you know. So, composers, and Beethoven was not the only one, but uh, composers during the time were kind of uh, pushing the piano, ma piano manufacturers to come up with an improved instrument, and they did over time. By the time we get to the mid-1800s, we basically have the, the modern piano that we know and love today. Okay, so all of that is just by way of pointing out that you will hear a dramatic difference in the, the way that Beethoven uses the piano, at least in this particular piece, certainly, and the way Mozart uh, used the piano in his concerto that we listened to last time. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, so this title, Piano Sonata in C minor, and remember, sonata, well, that's a term that we use to talk about a certain type of form, sonata form, which has exposition, development, and recapitulation, but sonata is also sometimes used as the title of a piece of music. And all it means is instrumental piece. So, piano sonata in C minor, OP13. What does that mean? Well, remember, this is an opus number. OP is an abbreviation for opus, which means work. And all that means is this is Beethoven's 13th published work. Not all composers have these opus numbers attached to their works, but Beethoven definitely does. Um, and what this indicates to us, well, if this is his 13th published work, um, this is an early work of Beethoven's. Beethoven's opus numbers run all the way up into the 130s. Right? So this is a relatively early work composed when he was in his mid to late 20s. Um, and this is another thing that I'll talk about more in our lecture on Beethoven. Um, and that is that Beethoven's music is always divided from an early to a middle to a late period. And so performers of Beethoven are always very conscious of whether they are performing an early period work, a middle period work, or a late period work. So there are stylistic changes as we go from the early to the middle to the late. Now, there are certainly characteristics that carry through all three periods. And Beethoven's personality is very distinctive and very much his the stamp of his personality is on absolutely everything that he composed. Um, but there are some differences, and I'll talk more specifically about those in a future lecture. Um, now, another thing that I want to talk about is since since we've been talking so much about form, you may get the impression that uh, these composers are really not all that creative because, after all, I mean it's sort of like a uh, it's sort of like a paint by numbers thing or like a uh, a mold that you're making cookies with, right? Um, that's that's sort of the wrong impression. What I've got on this sheet is is basically just uh, what we would expect to find typically. But as with anything else, you know, just because a typical automobile has four wheels, right, doesn't mean that there aren't a great that there isn't a great deal of variety from one car to the next, both in its function, in its style, and little details, right? And uh, there are lots of little tweaks and quirks and specific features that, that are not on this sheet that you might find in one piece or another. So, for example, last time when we talked about that Mozart piano concerto, I pointed out that in the development section of the first movement of that concerto, a new theme was introduced. Okay, well, what's the big deal? Well, that's not usually what happens in a development section. That is atypical. Usually, themes are introduced in the exposition. That's the, that's the role of the exposition, to present the thematic material. And usually, in a development section, we don't present new themes. Instead, we develop the themes that have already been presented, that we've already heard. 
Okay, but Mozart decided, and it's his piece after all, and he's a genius, he can do what he wants, he decided to introduce a new theme in the development section of that piano concerto. So that's a, an exception, a little quirk that I pointed out that's specific to that piece. And a, it's an example of how it you know, doesn't always conform exactly to what's on this sheet. Something similar happens in the first movement of this piano sonata by Beethoven. Typically, remember, the first movement of any multi-movement instrumental work of the classical era is fast in tempo. Now, this first movement of this Beethoven sonata actually is a fast movement, but it begins with a slow introduction. So we have an introductory section, which is slow, and, and it's marked grave, which means like slow and serious or solemn. And after that introductory section, which if you can read music, they have a few bars of it here. After that slow introductory section, then we get to the main uh, allegro section with the first theme and the bridge and the second theme, etc. So that's, again, a little a specific feature um, that is, is kind of uncommon. It's not unheard of, but it's kind of uncommon to have a slow introduction and then go into your fast uh, kind of typical or expected uh, fast tempo exposition. Okay, um, another thing I'll, I'll point out bef before we start, and we will listen to this in a moment, um, pay attention to the dramatic extremes that we find in Beethoven. Extremes of slow and fast, of soft and loud. Extremes of mood. Sometimes the mood is sort of very almost catatonic, kind of hypnotic. And then sometimes it's extremely aggressive, right? Extremely energetic, right? Um, so we're, we're sort of going beyond the classical notion of balance of, and, and especially of restrained emotions. Remember, that was a feature of the classical style, that the emotions should be controlled and restrained. Yes, we want to have, we want to have emotions being expressed, but they shouldn't go overboard because that would be in poor taste. The emotions should be kind of kept in check. And um, I think elsewhere in the chapter, they say that the composer keeps these, these restrained emotions in balance to each other, but always under the firm control. Um, with Beethoven, who is, remember, the latest, the last of these three classical masters, goes chronologically speaking, Haydn, then Mozart, then Beethoven. Beethoven... Uh, is uh, just his personality is so uh, kind of passionate that he uh, he is not trying to control his emotions. He's kind of putting it all out there. Um, and so with Beethoven, actually, it's a lot of these um, these characteristics of the classical style, which I spent a whole lecture describing they apply a little bit less well to Beethoven. Beethoven often turns them on their head or contradicts them, partly just because that's who he was. He was a kind of a rebellious kind of guy, but also because by the time we get to Beethoven, the times and the style are changing a little bit, are moving in the direction of the next era, which we will unfortunately not have time to get to in this semester. The Romantic era, which is all about emotions and extremes of emotions. Right? The Romantics, and, and some people would say, well, Beethoven is really leading the way to this Romantic style, where it's all about expressing the emotions and not keeping them in check or keeping them controlled. So you will hear that definitely in this piece. There's a, it's, it's highly emotionally charged. Okay. Um, I think I'll go ahead and start listening to it now. And again, I'm going to talk over it to describe certain features, especially the form, right? So what you should do is find the uh, saved videos and listen to it sometime without me talking over it. I've got a couple of performances uh, so that you can see how it's done as well as here, which is sometimes a, a kind of an interesting thing, especially with piano. All of these videos, by the way, that I've been putting up, since it's convenient just to grab them off of YouTube, you can see the performers. And sometimes I understand that, you know, uh, it might be distracting, especially in the case of conductors or pianists who are making like faces and moving around and gesturing and all that. So I'm just going to say, 
it's not strictly necessary in this kind of music, I don't think, to see anything. You don't have to, you can, if you find that distracting or off-putting, watching some pianists looking up the faces that a conductor's making, all that stuff. If that's a distraction, please don't watch it. Just listen. Music is an art that is meant to be listened to, experienced in here, not necessarily watched. All right. So I just wanted to sort of put that out there. If you enjoy watching the performers, fine, but don't feel like you have to look at the video just because I posted a video. I would actually much rather you, you spend more energy listening. And if that means not watching, or if it means even uh, listening in a dark room, keeping your eyes closed. I think that's a, an excellent way to listen to this kind of music because this music, it's meant to, to not just, just meant to be background. It's not meant to be like wallpaper, right? It's meant to involve every, every bit of, of your attention, right? Um, so you might try sometimes, listening to some of this music just with the lights off, uh, and with no other distractions, you know, don't necessarily have it on. I mean, it's okay to have it on while you're doing the dishes or doing your homework or something like that, whatever. But sometimes you should just listen to it and do nothing else, right? So anyway, uh, let's listen as I talk over it. And of course, we're starting with the slow introduction of the first movement, which has these heavy chords heavy dramatic chords. And to me there's a sense of, there's some kind of tension that's under the surface, that's trying to emerge. Beethoven. Notice how we have this melody which is kind of, we, we have a, a higher voice which has this sort of pleading quality, right? And then a lower voice which answers it in a sort of gruff, kind of refusing way. There's sort of a dialogue going on between this higher part with this upward motive. the lower part notice again that the, the contrast of mood it goes from being very very heavy and loud to being very ethereal and soft and then after this long scale we're off and running with the fast section. So this is the first theme. Notice how very fast it is. And already we're into the bridge. So now we're moving towards the second theme. And here it is. Second theme. This is kind of interesting too. This is giving the illusion of three hands. So in the middle hand you have these chords and the right hand has to jump over to present both the bass line and the melody. Very difficult, very challenging. And now we have another bridge. This bridge is going to take us to the closing theme or the closing section. Now we're in the closing theme, closing section. And in this performance, by the way, he's not going to repeat the exposition. He's going to move right on to the development section. So we're building up to the develop, development section. Here. Whoa, well that's kind of unexpected. Beethoven has brought back the slow introduction. When we first heard that slow introduction, 
it was not clear whether we would be hearing it again later on, but Beethoven is bringing it back with this these heavy, serious chords. And this is one of those instances of this sort of catatonic, hypnotic kind of mood, which suddenly goes away. Now we have that energetic kind of mood. Now we're in the development section, and we are modulating through different keys, and we are building tension. That's what normally happens in a development section. to the end of the development section and recapitulation starts here. So this is the first theme coming back. And here's our second theme. Same second theme we heard before. Again, chords in the middle, bass line and melody handled by the right hand, which has to jump. And now another bridge. And this is going to lead us towards our closing theme. our closing theme. So this is a signal to us that the movement is coming to an end, or at least that's what we expect. Like this. Sounds like it could be the end. But wait, maybe it's not. Aha! Beethoven has brought back that slow intro material again. And we're left wondering, well, when is it going to end exactly? Beethoven loves to kind of tweak his listeners' expectations. This is not what we expected. We were not expecting to hear this introductory material again. So now we're a little bit uncertain, like, how is it going to end? And again, we have that sort of catatonic lull. Maybe this is the end. Oh, fast tempo comes back, and it ends up ending with that kind of very assertive close. Now here's the second movement, which you may have heard before. This is one of Beethoven's best known works. Notice how the mood is completely different from the first movement. It's very calm, it's very serene, it's in a major key, and it's in rondo form. So this is the A section of the rondo. We could say this is the A theme. It's a very lyrical, very singable melody. You could imagine putting some words to it and turning it into a song. And this A theme is restated an octave up. different. This is the B theme. The accompaniment is a little bit different. We have repeated chords. The, the theme, the tune is a little bit different.
end of the B section, and we should expect that main A theme to come back, and there it is. this theme when it comes back because we've heard it before. Okay, now something different. Now we're in a minor key, a little bit more of a tragic mood. This is the C section. And notice how once again, like we had in the first movement, we've got chords in one hand and a sort of a duet between a higher melody and a bass line. This is going to be restated, so we're going to hear that again. Okay, so we have chords in the middle. Melody. We have a dialogue going on between the higher voice part, maybe a soprano and a bass. Almost like different characters. And that passes, and we get into a restatement of A again. So our main theme again. Stated one last time, up an octave again. section. So remember, we can have a coda on the end of any piece of music, in any era, any style. So the form of this movement, which is almost over, was A, B, A, C, A, coda. tempo was slow, and the mood was overall, for the most part, sort of lyrical, song-like, mostly serene, but with some dramatic little moments in there, but more emotionally restrained than the first movement was. Okay, so now the last movement, which is fast again, and in rondo form, this is our A theme. Notice how very fast again it is. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's our A section, and it's already over. This is a bridge to take us to the B section. Here's our B section. A material, and here it is. 
And so now A has come back. So now, something completely different. This is the C section. might be the, the last section or we might have a coda. Knowing Beethoven, I have a feeling we'll have a coda. There it is. It's kind of letting it all hang out in the coda. Notice how long this coda is. So, we have just heard a complete Beethoven sonata, one of 32 that he composed. This is one of his earlier uh, period sonatas. I encourage you to, uh, although we won't have as much time as I would like to in this course, I would really encourage you to just go surf YouTube and find recordings of Beethoven sonatas. They are just amazing pieces, and there are some really incredible pianists these days. Um, and uh, it'd really be worth your time to, to explore them. Um, I will maybe put up some, some more links of, of uh, other uh, works by Beethoven that aren't necessarily required, that wouldn't be on the listening for the test, for example. Um, but really, that's how I see this course. It's sort of like opening the door for you to maybe explore some of this stuff on your own. So if you like that, there's plenty more where that came from. All right, we will listen to some more Beethoven. We're going to listen to one more complete work, his best-known work, his Fifth Symphony. We're going to listen to the whole thing, because all four movements are actually in your listening and are in your book, and that's a piece that we really need to hear all the way through, all four movements, for it to have the intended effect, because it's one of the things about Beethoven. As we get to Beethoven, Beethoven is really thinking of these multi-movement works and thinking of ways to try and unify them so that they aren't like four separate pieces that just happen to be kind of gathered together on, under one title, like symphony or sonata or concerto. Beethoven increasingly is trying to find ways to bind these different movements together, to connect them in some way so that we have a, a sort of a holistic sense of, of a work that, that coheres, that sticks together. So that's something we will definitely see in the Fifth Symphony. Before we get to that, though, I think my next uh, one or two lectures 
will be, uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and they will be more biographical. I'm going to talk about these three composers, these three greatest composers of the classical era, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. There are little biographical sketches in uh, your textbook, maybe a page or two long for each of them. So, for example, the bio of Beethoven is here on page 197, 198. And there's a bio of Mozart back here on, oh, let's see, pages. Okay, here's, here's the Haydn bio, pages 177, 178. And the Mozart bio looks like it is here on pages 182 and 183. So read those pages, read those bios, and I will expand on them a little bit, um, and I'll talk about these three composers, do a little compare and contrast over the next couple of lectures. See you then.